Breaking news on that, Donald Trump's team has said it will immediately request a recount in the state of Wisconsin. The final result hasn't been declared there yet, but the majority of votes are in and are in favour of Joe Biden by just a fraction of a percent. So it is heating up stateside. Let me bring in now Home Secretary Priti Patel. Home Secretary, great to have you here. Did you stay up like the rest of us and watch this fascinating vote from the US last night? I'm clearly too much of a lightweight because I didn't stay up throughout the whole night because obviously I had to get up and do quite a bit this morning. But it's exciting. It is really exciting. It is. What what do you make of it all? Well, um, clearly we've got to wait and see the result, but it's all coming together right now. And, you know, they're a great ally of ours and we just want them to get through their process and obviously get back to, you know, building upon our special relationship that we have with the Americans. Indeed, indeed. Now, look, we have to start with something very serious, uh, Home Secretary. You raised our terror threat level from substantial to severe at this time yesterday in light of those horror radical Islamic attacks in France and Austria. So what do we need to know about that? Is there a specific threat or is this a reaction to what seems unfortunately to be the re-emergence of ISIS in Europe? Yes, so there are a couple of points really to make about this. I mean, this is you know, a very sobering issue. Um, And obviously, JTAC changed the threat level from substantial to severe. But at the same time, the public should not be alarmed at all. We just have to be vigilant. We have to be alert. And it's right that we do this as a precautionary measure. And it is following what have been, quite frankly, the most horrific events in France. Um, France has had far too many events recently. Mm. And then, of course, that on Monday night, we all put on the news and we saw the appalling events in Austria as well. So there is no immediate or specific threat. But and that's partly because we've already undertaken some very significant steps when it comes to our powers, but also using our law enforcement tools, our intelligence and security tools. When it comes to developing terrorist threats, we are absolutely on it. And that's the work of our security and intelligence services. But the fact of the matter is, when you look at the world right now and you look at the events that have taken place, they are disturbing, they are horrific. And our focus is to protect the British public first and foremost, which is why this has happened. Well, of course. And and I mean, sort of leading on to our next conversation point, I guess, do you worry, uh, because I do, I'm going to be honest, about our police being overstretched and not not able to focus as much as they need to on preventing terrorism and investigating crime because they're going to be having to do all of this enforcement of the COVID restrictions? Well, I think, um, first of all, it's a, it's a really legitimate and valid question. Um, obviously, the police are there to enforce law, law uphold the law um, and go after the criminals, you know, go after the individuals that obviously cause harm. And I've got to say this, Dan, if you recall when we had lockdown earlier on in the year, the full lockdown, mm. Mm. we saw some incredible work from our police officers. We had one of the biggest law enforcement operations this country has ever seen, which was Operation Venetic, where the cops were literally pulling ga- um, drugs, um, weapons, cash off the streets, arresting serious as criminals. They were slightly more visible, I should add, as well. But that was really great, while at the same time doing heroic work around COVID enforcement and engaging the British public and keeping the British public safe. So, you know, we've got more police officers than we've had in over 10 years. I announced last week we've got 5,824 more police officers. Those numbers are growing every single day. And then, of course, to your point about terrorism, We have specialist counterterrorism police. Um, We use our intelligence services and our agencies who throughout this extraordinary and quite frankly difficult year that we have had, have been doing the most incredible work when it comes to intelligence, um, preventing attacks, let's not forget preventing um, the deterrence that they put in place, but also keeping our public and our community safe. It does sound like, though, you do want the police to strengthen enforcement of COVID rules this time around. I know you met with the National Policing Board today, Mm -hmm. I think. Was that a request that you made to them? So I speak to policing leaders virtually every single day, and I have done throughout the coronavirus pandemic for a number of reasons. First of all, our police are on the front line every single day. Um, You know, Dan, I think you and I have spoken before about not just the great work that they do, but the fact that they put their own lives... Well, they're incredible. They're yeah, incredible. Yeah, well, they do, you know, so we see the assaults that come their way too. Especially um, we, this year, with everything well, we've been through. Well, we, we've 
And I should also just reflect on the fact that today was um, P- um, Sergeant Matt Ratana's funeral yeah. and we saw the horrific um, you know, assault that took place there. But you've asked specifically around enforcement. We have worked with the police every single day to understand and to hear from them about enforcement because they're on the front line doing enforcement. They're on the front line with these fixed penalty notices. They're on the front line when it comes to dealing with egregious breaches. And obviously we have to understand from them what is practical, what works, what doesn't work. Um, There is no point putting into regulation and guidance you know, measures that simply are counterproductive, won't work, you know, are challenging for the police. We have worked with them from day one, which is why we have the um, the fixed penalty notices, which is why we have the very high fines. If you think, you know, we have these £10,000 fines um, for mass gatherings, for example, they have worked with us on the level of fines. They have advised us about the fixed penalty notices and how they've been scaled up if you breach more than one fixed penalty notice. So they are doing amazing work. Um, Today at the National Policing Board, we've discussed not only the future of policing, the Police Uplift Programme, but actually the coronavirus regulations and how they will continue to enforce them. No, and I mean, I totally understand that, right? When you're talking about a mass gathering or a house party, of course I do. But you know when people start to get worried, Home Secretary, is when we hear from the West Midlands uh, Police Commissioner, David Jameson, raising the prospect of police breaking up family dinners on Christmas Day. I, I mean, surely that isn't a good use of police resources. And of course, the police will not be doing that. That's a minority view. That's a police and crime commissioner um, expressing his own personal view and opinion. As I've said, I speak to, you know, the head of the um, oh, policing leaders every day from across the country, including chief constables, you know, from the College of Policing, the MPCC, the real leaders out there that are directing and guiding and helping us put into regulation sensible and practical policing measures that actually will help to keep the public safe in the long run because this will help to stop or prevent the spread of the virus and of course that is our priority and our focus because we all want to get the R value down and if we all play our part and I I have to say Dan I think the British public have been incredible um, throughout the first lockdown following the rules you know, you see this. You, I'm sure you've been reporting this as well on your own news bulletins. You hear about the egregious breaches. You hear about the rage. You hear about the house parties. You hear about people being, quite frankly, irresponsible and putting others and their lives at risk because they're the minority. The majority are absolutely doing the right thing and following the rules. Absolutely. And I should, should just add to that, there are yeah. a lot of businesses out there that are doing exactly the right thing as well and have followed many of the rules. No, indeed. Now, look, I know, Home Secretary, you are a great lover of liberty. So do you have any sympathy for these 53 Tory MPs who felt they were unable to vote for lockdown two today? Well, I spend every day, Dan, speaking to my colleagues, Conservative MPs in particular. And of course, we are the party of freedom and liberty and individual empowerment and all the virtues that, you know, underpin conservative values and beliefs. So I think we all feel this. We absolutely all feel this. And, you know, the prime minister himself has said this repeatedly. He said it today again. You know, these are not measures that we just take flippantly or lightly. We are doing this now. We don't want to impose these kinds of measures, you know, in this sort of in a punitive or deliberate way, but we just cannot ignore many of the facts, the evidence that the number of COVID patients in hospital has increased. I've seen this in my own region, by the way, but also the number of patients in ventilator beds that has increased. We're seeing the number of hospital admissions increase as well. And at the same time, we have to think about the general health of individuals that use the NHS. We're only in the autumn, and we know for a fact that as we go into winter, people get unwell. And that puts greater strain and pressure on our NHS. And we want to prevent that, which is why we urge the British public who are, you know, I've, I've got every, you know, every instinct in, you know, in my body is about individual rights, freedom and liberty, along with all my colleagues. But at the same time, we want to act to make sure that we protect the lives of many others as well. And that is the reason why we're bringing in the measures that okay. we are. Can, can I just clarify something that's been in the news over the past couple of days? Because there doesn't seem to be a, a clear directive on it. Can folk protest still? And will they be allowed to protest against lockdowns? 
So I've always said this, that the right to peaceful protest is, of course, you know, it's central to our democracy. Um, and of course, we've also seen, as you know, in the summer, I think we spoke about this, in these unprecedented circumstances that we're in, gatherings risk spreading the disease. So I'm urging yet again people to follow the rules um, that are being outlined. And under the new regulations, um, people obviously can do certain things outdoors um, in terms of bubbles, exercise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we do not want protests. It's as simple as that. We do not encourage and support protests. And the reason being is because, you know, we want to see people complying by the rules. Um, and actually, by complying by the rules as well, um, the police will continue to do what they do, engage, explain, encourage. But if we comply by the rules, and of course, you know, people will get more freedoms in the long run. And the right to a peaceful protest, as I said, as a cornerstone of our democracy, we can, people that do want to express their views and opinions can get back to doing that after we are out of these mm -hmm. types of measures. But right now, we all have to be diligent mm -hmm. and sensible and, you know, do the right thing effectively yeah. and do it for other people. And does that mean any protests will be shut down? Because, of course, the Bill of Rights 1689 is still in force and cannot be changed by secondary legislation, can it? So I just wonder where where the legality is, because if people choose to have a protest, will it actually be, be stopped or are you just encouraging people uh, to try and not do that? Well, first of all, I would urge people, I wouldn't encourage, I would absolutely urge the public not to gather in this way. Um, you know, and the point is, these rules are very clear about all gatherings and they, they apply to protests too. They absolutely apply to protests. And um, the police, I should just add a couple of points around mm -hmm. protests. Even throughout coronavirus, um, the police have always engaged, not just with the British public, but individuals that are responsible for protests too. And they're all told to follow the rules, but the police will enforce the law as well. And in these regulations, you know, uh, the rules are very clear that obviously people should not be gathering and that applies to protests. So the police will be enforcing the rules. Freddie Vitale, Home Secretary, know how busy you are. Great to chat again. Thank you so much for being here.